Her name was Darla. I met her on Bumble. I was stoked when she messaged me because from looking at her pictures, she looked way out of my league. She had long brown wavy hair like a Victoria's Secret model and deep dimples when she smiled. Her eyes were a brilliant blue that I could have gotten lost in for days. I was thrilled when she messaged me. We set up a date to grab drinks and the conversation flowed so easily. We both enjoyed hiking, skiing, and concerts and admitted to being homebodies. We listened to the same music and she gave me some great book recommendations. After the first date, she texted me asking if it would be okay if we could just be friends. I was crushed. Her reasoning was that she wanted to find someone religious like her. She explained she had a rough childhood, going from orphanage to orphanage, foster family to foster family. Her faith was the only constant thing in her life. I accepted it because I couldn't see myself with someone long term who was super into the religion thing. It was just never my cup of tea. We agreed to be friends. We hung out quite a bit, to the point she felt like my best friend. I would be lying if I didn't admit I still had a crush on her, but I knew those feelings would never be returned. When Darla started seeing someone she went to church with, I knew I'd never be her guy. Thanksgiving rolled around and Darla had nowhere to go since she grew up without a family. Her boyfriend felt like it was too early for her to meet his family, so I invited her to my family's Thanksgiving. She lit up at the suggestion. I would love to, oh my goodness, thank you, she told me. I was a little taken aback by how excited she was to celebrate the holiday with me. Thanksgiving came and I offered to pick her up and drive her to my parents' house. I was very clear with my parents that she was only a friend with nowhere else to go didn't need them embarrassing me. We pulled up to my house and Darla said, this is your parents house? My parents lived in a small mansion with grand windows and a double front door. People usually made a comment when they saw it. Yeah, my dad comes from old money, I said. I don't like talking about how I was brought up because people treat me differently once they learn about my background. They think I'm lazy and have no work. Money was never an issue growing up. And on top of that, we had a fulfilling family life. My parents still adored each other after 36 years of marriage, and I had a close relationship with them. Until now, I always wanted to get married, have kids, and have a family like the one I grew up in. I felt blessed, but now it feels like a lie. I used my key to enter the house, and my parents greeted us from the dining room. Charlie, come in, come in, my mom said, excited to see Darla and me. You must be Darla. It is a pleasure to meet you. Come here, you. I'm a hugger. My mom went in to hug Darla, but Darla stepped back. Darla smiled. Sorry, I have a thing about physical touch. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate having a place to go. Here, I brought some wine. Charlie said you guys like Merlot. Oh man, it would have been better if you brought two bottles, one for each of us. My dad joked. Make yourselves comfortable. Dinner is about to be ready. Honey, will you help me in the kitchen? My mom said. The two of them walked into the next room. Darla and I sat on the couch. She told me, Your parents seem nice, very welcoming. It's weird. It almost feels like I've met them before. My parents get that a lot. They love hosting. I responded, I'm going to check if they need any help, but you stay here. You're the guest, so you don't lift a finger. As I walked up to the kitchen, I heard my parents whispering. I could barely make out what they were saying. I think my mom said, Does she look Valerie? My dad said, A little, but there's no way it could be her. She hasn't given us an issue in 20 years. They went back and forth some more, but I couldn't make it out. I stepped into the kitchen and they immediately stopped talking. I asked if they needed any help and they said no. But you kids can move to the dining table. We are ready to eat, my mom said, holding a golden turkey. We all moved into the dining room. My parents offered Darla some of the wine she brought, but she politely declined. She told them she didn't drink too much because it made her anxious. I noticed Darla watching my dad closely as he sipped the Merlot. She smiled. My dad started. So Darla, what do you do? 
I'm currently in school pursuing a degree in psychology so I can become a counselor. They kept making small talk, but somehow, the topic of Darla's family came up. I think it was my dad who asked her. I tried intervening because it didn't seem appropriate, but Darla stopped me. No, it's okay. I'm happy you brought it up, actually. Darla smiled at my mom and dad. I was given up for adoption at a young age, four to be exact. My dad shifted in his seat and the color drained from his face. My family put me up for adoption because my father sexually abused me and I tried to tell my mom about it. My mom choked on the wine. They decided the best way to handle the situation was to throw me out entirely. Darla laughed. My parents looked at each other. I could see my mom's hands shaking from across the table. Well, that's quite the story, dear, my mom said. Darla responded. I thought you would say something like that. She turned to me. I'm sorry to ruin your holiday. You're a really good guy. I'm baffled these two raised a gentleman. Vivin. She called my mom out by her name. I don't know how she could know her first name. How about you tell your son the truth? About me. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, I don't mind telling them. Darla retorted. Charlie, I'm your sister. That's why I rejected you. I didn't want to kiss my brother, not even for revenge. She turned to my parents. Are you guys enjoying the Merlot? I put a little something extra in it for you. She smiled so sweetly it disturbed me. Wait! I cut in. Revenge? You're my sister. And your dad is a pervert, and your mom is an enabler. Thank God you were born a boy, or you would have had the same fate as me. <coughs> My dad started to cough uncontrollably. He stood up and grabbed his throat. Shortly after, my mom kept clearing her throat until she couldn't fight the coughs anymore. I'm sorry, Charlie, Darla told me. She explained how she had been planning her revenge since she was ten. She listed all the foster families that abused her and her horrible treatment in orphanage. My mom started heaving. I went around the table to check on her. Mom, are you okay? She shook her head. I looked at Darla. What did you do? I put something in the wine. She checked her phone for the time. Each of them has roughly 15 more minutes before their last breath. They're not good people, Charlie. My mom collapsed to the floor, still dry heaving. My father looked pale in his seat, moving in small circles like he was nauseous. I went to grab my phone to call 911, but Darley beat me to it. No, not yet. We wait, Charlie. Listen, they've lied to you your whole life. Your father did bad things to me when I was a toddler. So many thoughts were rushing through my head. I didn't know how to feel or react. My dad was a pedophile and my parents lied to me about my sister my whole life. Now here she is, murdering them in front of my eyes. Ten more minutes passed, and during that time, Darla explained every horrible thing that occurred in her life after being put up for adoption. Once she felt like she tortured them enough, she picked up her phone and dialed 911. Hello? She said with urgency. Please send someone. I think my parents ate something. They're both choking. My mom is on the floor, dry heaving. I don't know what to do. Please, send someone. She hung up the phone and returned to being calm and collected. By the time they're here, they'll both be dead. Don't rat me out, Charlie. We can get away with this. You're insane. That's why I go to therapy once a week. She laughed. They deserve this. I heard my mom call my name. It was barely audible. I held her hand as the light left her eyes. I looked over to my dad. He slumped forward in his chair, eyes wide open, not blinking. Can I trust you, Charlie? She was the only family I had left. I also wondered if she would do something to me if I refused. I slowly nodded my head as tears gathered in my eyes. The cops came and took our information and statements. They later declared my parents' death accidental due to bad wine. Apparently, the substance Darla mixed in the wine couldn't be traced in their system. I don't talk to Darla much more. I'm still processing what happened. What I let happen.
I hated working for this e-commerce company because I got yelled at every day for not being able to meet management's ridiculous expectations. They fired me because I didn't finish my assigned route, but let me tell you why I didn't finish it. To say I had a good reason is an understatement. What did they want me to do? Leave that girl? The day started like any other. Before the sun began climbing up the horizon, I was up making coffee. I filled up my 34-ounce coffee tumbler and was on my way. I was never a morning person, but one thing I loved about that job was watching the sunrise. This particular morning, the sun cast a deep pink color across the clouds with yellow streaks. When I arrived at the warehouse, I was informed I would be covering someone else's route, along with my usual one. I needed the money, so I welcomed the overtime. The route I picked up would take me deep into the swamp. The rural routes were the worst because time moved so slowly with such long distances between stops. I took the news with a smile, collected all the packages for both routes, and was on my way. My usual route took me seven hours. It was mostly in the suburbs, so it was easy and predictable. Lots of dogs barked at me. Some places had front doors I had to hunt for. At one of the stops, a cat came out and greeted me. Once all those packages were delivered, I pivoted to the other route. The first stop was a 45-minute drive from where I was. I sighed and said, so it begins. Rural routes have about the same number of packages as urban ones, but fewer stops. It takes just as long to do the rural routes because you drive for so long between houses. It was business as usual, until I rolled up to this hut of a home. It looked like it would fall into the swamp and sink if someone sneezed too close to it. It sat on the water's edge and was hidden among the green trees. This stop had a lot of packages, way more than all the others. I needed to unload 12 boxes, the most I have ever had to drop at one location. I started unloading the boxes and putting them by the front door. On my second trip, the front door creaked open as I stood up from placing the boxes. I recoiled back to see a scraggly old man. He had a few tufts of hair on his head and wore a grease-stained wife beater with very short shorts. His thighs were so white the sunlight reflected off them, hurting my eyes. Honestly, he may have been wearing briefs. Are you delivering, guy? He barked at me. His voice sounded rusted from a life of smoking cigarettes. Yes, sir, I answered. You have a few more packages and then I'll be on my way. He didn't say anything in response, but whipped out a switchblade to start ripping open the boxes. I continued unloading my van. I had two more trips I needed to make for him. As I put the last few down, the old man snapped, You're not going anywhere until I confirm everything is here! I couldn't give good enough a reason for not staying, so I just nodded. As he ripped boxes open, I peered into his home. There wasn't much to it except one door locked from the outside with a padlock. It hid behind a round dinner table. The old man started grumbling to himself. They think they can steal from me? I'll show them. Who stole from you? I asked. He must have forgotten I was there because my question startled him. You did, he whispered with spite. This catapulted him into a rant about a package that was supposedly delivered, but he never received it. I suggested that it might have been delivered to the wrong address or stolen. Either way, I told him, you can file a claim and they should refund you or send you a replacement. No problem. That happened to me before and they were quick to make it right. He stared into my eyes, not saying anything, just scowling at me. He pointed his switchblade at me. You're not going anywhere until I make sure everything is here, he growled. I lifted my hands in defense. <laughs> you got it, man. Whatever makes you comfortable. From under the locked door, I saw a shadow move. I looked at the man, and he was focused on taking stock of his purchases. Anyone live here with you? A wife, maybe? I asked. He turned away from the packages and got up in my face. That's none of your goddamn business! Okay, sorry, just trying to make small talk, I responded. Something about the locked door didn't sit right with me. Obviously, locking any door from the outside is suspicious. Like, what did he keep in there? I'm just going to make sure I didn't forget anything in the truck for you, I said, so I could sneak away for a second to investigate. 
I walked to the back of my truck and peered around it to wait until he became absorbed by his packages again. Before moving to the side of the house, I assessed the route. I needed to be quick and quiet or else the old man would notice. Once I had a plan, I was off. I snaked my way to the side of the house and looked through the windows. The old man must have been a hoarder because there were piles of junk everywhere. Flies danced in the air in every room. I couldn't see much of the kitchen, but I could see the peak of a mountain of dishes. After a few more steps, I could see into the locked room. The windows had newspapers taped over them, but I found one small hole that allowed me to peek in. I couldn't believe my eyes. There was a pregnant young woman who couldn't have been more than 21 years old. Her blonde hair was so long. It must have been years since her last haircut. In her room, I could make out a tattered mattress on the floor and a large stack of books that looked like each must have been read five times. The girl spotted my eye in the hole. She gasped and held her stomach. She put a finger over her mouth to signal me to be quiet. It's not like I was going to holler at the old man, but who knows the last time she saw someone. She mouthed, help. Carefully, I made it back to my van. I looked at the old man. He now had his phone out. He must have been cross-checking the app. I took out my phone to call the authorities, but had no service. I returned to the old man and tried to figure out what to do. That girl had been locked up for years by the looks of it. I wondered if anyone had ever called the police on the man before. Was he the kind that could change his demeanor and fool the police to get them to go away? I felt he may have been, because to keep someone hostage for so long, you have to have some evasion skills. I wondered if I had anything that could break the lock in my van. But then I had my idea. Excuse me, sir, is there any chance I could use your bathroom? I don't get to stop very often, so might as well now that I have a chance. He looked me up and down. He turned to look in his house and turned back to assess me again. Sure, follow me, he said. I thanked him, and he led me inside. Piles of junk were divided by skinny walkways so he could move through his home. I followed him to the bathroom, and he motioned to it. I had to squeeze by him to get into the bathroom without knocking over his clutter. The bathroom was disgusting. The old man probably never cleaned it. The toilet was such a dark brown it looked black. I planned to find something in his home to smash the lock, but he didn't leave the bathroom door. I saw his shadow below the door waiting to escort me out. I looked around the bathroom. The heaviest thing I could find was the lid of the back of the toilet. I peed to keep up appearances. I grabbed the toilet lid and opened the door slowly. Did you wash your hands? He asked, disgusted. Before I could process that he, of all people, commented on my hygiene, I lifted the porcelain lid and smashed it on his head. It cracked in half. The old man collapsed, knocking over a bunch of newspapers. I jumped over him and headed to the locked room. As I hurried over, I tried to find bolt cutters or something to break the door open. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw an axe. Quickly, I grabbed it and climbed over all the old man's junk to break the door down. Get away from the door! I yelled at the girl. At the first swing of the axe, I heard her gasp behind the door. I kept swinging until a big enough hole was created to kick down the rest. The girl was crying. I extended my hand and helped her through the hole. The man began to grumble and get up. Hey! He yelled. What the hell do you think you're doing? Do you have any idea who you're stealing from? The girl paid him no regard and bolted to the door. We couldn't move that fast because of how pregnant she was, but we made it to the van before the old man could get on his feet. I helped her into the passenger seat and buckled her in. I backed my van out and sped away. We went to the nearest police station to file a report. The girl explained how she wasn't sure how long she had been there. She had been there so long she couldn't remember her real family. The girl explained how this was her second pregnancy. Her first one had miscarried, and it made the man so mad he refused to feed her for a week. The police returned to the old man to take him into custody, but they found him dead. He had taken his gun and shot himself in the head. 
By the time I made it back to the warehouse, my supervisor was furious. I explained the situation to him, thinking he would understand, but he said I should have alerted him so that they could have dispatched someone to pick up the rest of the packages. That's why they fired me. Ridiculous, right? They said it was my third strike or something for not finishing my route. But I thought they'd cut me a break since I saved a kidnapping victim. I still haven't found a job, but the girl, Rebecca, was reunited with her family. So who cares if I lost my job? I helped reunite a family. About a month ago, I met this guy on Hinge who seemed like the perfect match. His name was Nick. His photo was gorgeous, and he was interested in the same kinds of movies and books that I liked. And the best part was that he lived pretty close to my office. We chatted for a few days and I really got to know him. He was a veterinarian, and he'd just moved to the city a few months before. We were both interested in more than just a hookup, so we decided to first meet for dinner at the Italian restaurant near my work. I got there first and anxiously waited to meet him. When Nick walked in, all my excitement disappeared. I could tell it was him, but he looked about 10 years older and 100 pounds heavier than his photos. He smiled at me and then waddled over. He sat across from me and said I was even more beautiful in person. I didn't know how to respond, so I just nodded. We talked for a bit. He seemed nice enough, but I already knew that I wasn't going to see him again. I have nothing against older men or overweight men, but I didn't like that he'd lied about it. People on dating apps should always use current photos. Nick ordered two entrees and scarfed them both down like he hadn't eaten in weeks. I just ordered a salad, but I knew the faster I ate it, the faster I could get this date over with. After Nick paid, he asked me if I wanted to go back to his place. I said, not tonight. I thought that was diplomatic. He looked at me disappointed, but he told me that he understood. Then he mentioned a different restaurant that we could check out on our next date. That was the moment I should have said I wasn't interested, but I felt so awkward. Eventually, I just said, maybe. Then I kissed him on the cheek and ran out of there. I was hoping Nick would take the hint and leave me alone, but he called me about an hour later saying how much fun he had and how beautiful I was. I didn't respond. He texted me again the next day, and I still didn't respond. This went on for the rest of the week, and he just wouldn't take the hint. That Saturday, I was planning to stay at home and catch up on some chores when there was a loud knock on my door. It was Nick! He had an expensive bouquet of flowers in his hands and a big smile on his face. Surprise! He said. And it definitely was. I didn't know how he'd found my address. He asked if he could come inside and I finally got the nerve to tell him that I wasn't interested. I was very apologetic about it, explaining that I was still hung up on my last boyfriend, Eric. That wasn't true, of course, but it was less insulting than the truth. He handed me the flowers and said that he understood, then he left. I thought that was the end of it. I was very wrong. The next day my cousin called me. She sounded hysterical. I asked her what was wrong and she said that Eric, my ex, had been murdered the night before. Someone had snuck into his apartment and strangled him. I couldn't believe it. I was horrified. But I instantly thought of Nick. Could Nick have done that? Was he really that insane? I got my answer about an hour later when Nick texted me again. He wrote, I'm sorry about your ex, but does this mean we can be together now? I didn't respond. I drove straight to the police and showed them the message. They understood my concern, but Nick's message wasn't proof that he'd actually done something to Eric. They promised to call him in for questioning, but that was the best they could do. For the rest of the day, I couldn't stop thinking about poor Eric. He was a terrible boyfriend, but he didn't deserve to die. I went to bed pretty early, but I woke up to a loud pounding on my front door. I grabbed a baseball bat just in case and walked downstairs to see who was there. As I expected, Nick was waiting on my porch. He looked furious. I kept the chain on the door so he couldn't get in. Then I told him to leave. You called the cops on me? He screamed. They've been grilling me for hours. He kicked at the door, but the chain held in its place. 
go away! I shouted at him. I didn't hurt your boyfriend, he said. I swear! I didn't believe that for a second. Nick instantly lost all his anger. It was like he turned off a switch. His voice went really quiet and he asked if I could let him inside so we could talk things out. I told him no. He nodded and silently walked away. I closed the door and again called the police. They told me to stay inside and wait for them to arrive. I turned on all my lights and sat in my living room. I still had the baseball bat in my hands. I couldn't sleep, obviously, so I just sat there and waited. After 20 minutes, the police still hadn't come. I thought I'd heard sirens a bit earlier, but I guess they were on another call. Suddenly, I heard soft footsteps coming from the other room. Nick had come back. He was inside the house. I sprung to my feet and held the bat against my chest. I stayed in the center of the room so that Nick wouldn't be able to jump out and surprise me. I know you're there, I shouted. The police are coming. They're already here, Nick shouted from the other room. He slowly walked through the kitchen door, but he wasn't alone. A policeman was with him. Nick held a knife up to his throat. Nick must have gotten to the cop before he could reach my door. Why are you doing this? I asked. I just wanted a second date, Nick said. Is that too much to ask? I looked at the cop, hoping that he'd tell me what to do, but he just looked terrified. The holster on his belt was empty, and Nick was pressing so hard on the knife that a trickle of blood slid down the cop's neck. I'll do whatever you say, I told Nick, but you have to let him go. Sorry, Nick said. He's seen too much. I started crying. I begged him not to hurt me. It's okay, he said. Don't cry. He stepped closer with his arms outstretched. He was trying to comfort me with a hug. He still had the bloody knife, though. He wrapped his arms around me and pressed my head into his shoulder. It's okay, it's okay. Moving on instinct, I pushed him off me and then slammed my baseball bat into the side of his head. He wasn't expecting that. He toppled onto the ground, mere feet away from the cop's body. Why did you do that? He asked. I slammed the baseball bat again, this time against his hand. His knife skidded across the floor. I think I broke his wrist, too. He looked up at me, his eyes pleading for me to stop. But I didn't. I struck him again, and he fell flat on the ground. He stopped moving. Another officer arrived on the scene pretty soon after. She called an ambulance to take Nick away. He was still alive, but barely. The first cop wasn't so lucky. Nick is at the hospital right now. I'm waiting to hear if he'll recover. But if he does, it'll be behind bars. I haven't gone on a date since. I don't think I'll be ready for a long, long time. My name is Julius, and I'm 23 years old. Some time ago, I was working at the night shift as a Dunkin' Donuts employee. I was trying to earn some money to go to university. At that time, I was still living with my sister, Bree. She was 15 years older than me, and since both my parents died of cancer, when I was still a teenager, my sister became particularly important in my life. After a couple of months, I got used to the job. Most customers were nice, and even the sketchy and the weird ones who appeared to be on pills or homeless didn't pose any troubles. They just ordered their coffee or hot chocolate, a donut, went to their table no problem. Some even fell asleep there for a couple of hours, which didn't bother me at all. There was a cat which wandered around the surroundings of the Dunkin' Donuts. It didn't get inside, but whenever I left the place to go home by foot, the cat started to ask for attention, which also meant food, of course. It was a white female cat, very dirty, obviously from living in the streets. As days, or better said nights, went by, I started feeding her and petted her as well. Eventually, after speaking to my sister about it, I decided to adopt the cat. I took her to the vet to clean her up, and for vaccines and everything else. I gave her the name White Donut. White Donut was very gentle and peaceful. My sister, though, didn't like my cat that much. But why? She doesn't bother anyone, just likes to relax and be on her own, I said. Yes, but that's what creeps me out. She's always staring and observing, like she is planning something. 
Those were Bree's arguments. Aha, many people have that perception when it comes to cats in general. She isn't very expressive, but her presence calms me down, and she definitely likes to be here. I'm glad I saved her from the streets. It's good karma, Bree, to rescue hungry and homeless cats. Don't worry, you'll get used to White Donut here. Those were my arguments. Since I was working the night shift, I got up at around 11 a.m. Bree had a traditional 9 to 5 p.m. schedule, so she left the house while I would be asleep. But that late morning, a Wednesday, busy day and night for both of us, I realized that my sister had left both her cell phone and her wallet in the house, and also her shoes and coats. This meant she never left. Her bedroom door was, in fact, still closed, but Bree always left it open. I knocked on my sister's bedroom door and called for her. Bree, are you still in bed? Sick or something? No response. Maybe she simply fell asleep, I thought to myself. I didn't want to invade her privacy, so I kept knocking on the door and shouting. Still, complete silence. Bree, I'm worried. I'm coming in, I said. But the door was locked, and Bree never locked the door. I'm not the strongest dude in the world, I admit, so I went to get some iron tool to smash the lock. Finally, I was in. The room was completely dark. Bree? I said as I switched on the light. I was surprised to see my cat lying on top of my sister, looking at her. I guess it was possible that Bree slept in her room, but didn't see White Donut if the cat happened to be hiding under the bed. My concerns were directed to my sister, though. I went to her. Bree? Her eyes and mouth were wide open. I could listen to her heavy breathing. Bree, what's wrong with you? I shouted, afraid of moving her. My cat ran away and left my sister's bedroom. I immediately called the emergency number. They arrived in less than 30 minutes, but as the paramedics approached my sister, suddenly, she simply took a deep breath, started coughing, and came back to her senses. Are you alright? One of the paramedics asked. Yes, I think so. I don't know what happened. It's like I froze or something. But I'm okay now. Thank you, Bree said, looking at the paramedics, and at me like she was waking up from some kind of trance, still catching her breath but feeling notoriously better. Well, maybe we should take you to the hospital anyway to check up on you, the leading paramedic suggested. No, no, it's not necessary. I'm good, really. See? My sister said as she got out of the bed and started walking around. Okay then, it's your call. Goodbye. The paramedic said, probably frustrated with the fact that their help wasn't needed, and I just wasted their time. Sorry, I said. Oh, not at all. It's better this way. The paramedic said before leaving with his colleague. Wow, I was really scared, Bree, I said, when being alone again with my sister. Me too. I couldn't move or breathe, but I'm fine now. In any case, I'm taking the day off. That sounds like a great idea, I said. Friday arrived, and it was my night off. I was tired and wanted to get some sleep. My cat, unfortunately, was nowhere to be seen. She probably left the house when the paramedics arrived. I watched a movie with my sister and went to bed. I woke up in the middle of the night. There was someone in bed with me, but it wasn't my cat. Bree, my sister, was by my side. What are you doing? I shouted as I got out of bed, confused. You were nice to me, and I wanted to show you my affection. Usually, I'm not very emotional, but you were different. You're my older sister. Are you insane? No, I'm not your sister. Yeah, you're definitely insane. Probably from that attack. You need to get your brain checked, Bree, and put some clothes on, please. As my sister got up from the bed, she made a movement with her left hand, and I froze. I couldn't move or speak, and she spoke to me. I'm not Bree, my dear. I'm a female demon. I wandered from host to host. I was inside the cat that you adopted, and then I moved into your sister's body. I consume and thrive on the souls from the bodies that I occupy. I wanted to show you my affection. You were very kind to me when I was inside the cat's body. You're a good boy, Julius. Unfortunately, your sister is no more. I'm sorry. But that's, that's how, how I survive. survive. I'm, I'm sleeping, sleeping now. Sleep. She said. 
making another movement, and I fainted. The next morning, I woke up in my bed. Bree was gone. I reported her as a missing person and even hired a private investigator. But so far, my sister, or whoever she is now, is yet to be found, dead or alive. To be honest, my heart doesn't believe the words I heard that night. I still believe my sister is there somewhere, and one day she would come back. I don't want to be all alone in this world.